Uh, reopening. Let's talk some Lyft earnings. We got Lyft coming out. Uh, this is a name that's uh, also facing some weakness here, Jenny, this morning, but a huge recovery since November of last year, uh, where we've been on a tear here in Lyft. And this is one that, uh, when you compare it to Uber, certainly the more pure play reopening trade. A good point, Alex, because Uber, I think, was sort of driven in the last year by their, you know, their delivery for their food segment. Now, Lyft obviously doesn't have that same segment, so a lot of analysts are saying they're actually poised for a, say, more prominent recovery, being that they didn't have this other sort of leg to stand on that Uber did in the last year. Now, they have earnings today post-market, and they've actually missed pretty significantly in their last two reports on analyst estimates. But like you said, they've been in a bit of a recovery now. The last week, they've seen some weakness. They're seeing some pretty significant weakness today, down about 5.5%. But they are doing a lot of things to sort of you know, ease their balance sheet and make themselves more profitable. Now, this will not be included in their most recent report, but last week, they did announce selling their autonomous vehicle division to Toyota's subsidiary for about $550 million. Now, the stock didn't necessarily react super positively, but if you actually read deeper into this report, this deal is expected to remove about $100 million in annualized non-GAAP operating expenses, mostly from Lyft's R&D. So this would accelerate their path to potentially adjusted even a profitability and management was saying this was a very strong step forward for the company so i thought that was really interesting because it was sort of read by the market as a bad thing but if you d dive deeper into that report i don't think it's necessarily is now they also announced back in march that the company saw positive year-over-year -year growth in their daily rideshare volume for the first time in a year and they said beginning mid-march their that their volume will be expected to grow positively year over year and also every subsequent week through the end of 2021. Now, Uber echoed pretty much the same sentiment, but this was its best week they saw back in March in nearly a year. So that, I think, is a really, really good sign for Lyft. Now, Morgan Stanley also issued, I thought, a super interesting report sort of on the recovery in these ride-sharing companies, both Uber and Lyft, saying that they are very bullish on these companies based on the slope of the economic recovery. And Morgan Stanley estimates about 60% of 2019 rideshare volumes come from a combination of either social events or restaurants or bars or travel. So if you consider the fact that that is all supposedly on the rise, coming back to more normalized levels, these companies are positioned to only benefit from that. Now, jobless claims also continue to lower, as we've seen through April's report. So another positive sentiment for a lift is we're seeing now the labor force start to come back. And I also think it's interesting when you look at large states like California sets their, their um reopening for June 15th and New York July 1st. So you have to think that as cities start to see more normalized levels of, you know, social interaction and travel, these companies, I believe, are some of the first to really benefit. And right now, this noise in social media for these companies is a little bit mixed because right now we're experiencing, if you've taken a Lyft or an Uber recently, it's prices are very high, I have to admit, and right now they're taking a little bit longer to get to you with some of these labor constraints we're still seeing. So that brings me to our first tweet today, which says, Uber says gross bookings in March were the highest in the company's history. Uber, now this was from a few weeks ago, so this is not, Uber is not up 3% pre-market, nor is Lyft, but then they continue and say, as vaccination rates increase, we are observing that consumer demand for mobility is recovering faster than driver availability. So this is sort of what we're seeing, I'm seeing across the board. I've experienced it myself, but also on social media is that right now, a lot of drivers have left Uber and Lyft. So they're sort of having the shortage in labor, which is then making the prices, of course, go up because no one is driving. Now, I hope that as things normalize and different cities reopen, this gets better because right now it is very expensive to Uber or Lyft, both alike. And so I think that's a little bit of a headwind for both of these companies. But what we always talk with the two of these is sort of the, you know, loyalty you have to maybe one or the other, which is what our next tweeter highlights, which says, took a Lyft today for the first time in over a year. Tried Uber, but Lyft responded faster. So I have to say that, you know, there is this degree of, do you take an Uber if you're loyal to Uber? Do you take a Lyft if you're loyal to Lyft? 
I disagree. I think that you honestly pick whatever is cheapest and fastest to get to you. So I think these companies mutually will benefit from, of course, these reopenings. And I don't think there's necessarily a loyalty unless you're like a huge Uber Eats order, maybe. But I do think right now it's all about getting a ride as quickly and easily as possible, Kevin. Yeah, Jenny, listen, I think the most important thing for Lyft and Uber is big cities opening up, right? The mm -hmm. middle of the country, you know, takes Chicago out of that. The middle of the country is not where Uber and Lyft make their money. They make their money in large urban areas where these uh, Uber rides, this ride sharing was able to, you know, take over where cabs and taxis were. So I think New York, I think uh, California opening up is big for them, but that being said, I think what Jenny alluded to is, is real, which is these companies are a mess in terms of getting bodies back on the road and their prices are absurd right now. And so I think they've got a lot of disruption and problems coming and not to mention uh, regulatory risk from reclassifying, there's lawsuits that they're gonna have to continue to win, uh, you know, to stay with independent contractors as drivers. So, you know, I think these companies are on their way back. I think the overall opening the economy is really good for them. That doesn't mean this stock is a good buy or a good, you know, directional play here. So this is very tricky because, you know, these stocks are well off their highs that they rallied to during the euphoria of reopening. So there's a lot to go through here, guys, uh, to figure out which direction this these stocks are going to go post earnings, guys. A lot of uh, those who are taking Lyft and Ubers too, guys, they're taking these on a daily basis as commuters. And so with more and more working from home, and maybe that stays uh, that way permanently, that's going to put a little bit of a uh, pressure on the uh, the bottom lines uh, for these companies as well. And so we'll see uh, as things go forward. But I think Jenny's point around uh, loyalty to these brands uh, is a strong one. So I can say sure. I may check one of them first every time, but if something looks a little bit off, I'm certainly checking the other one before I'm hit and go. So uh, we'll see if uh, uh, that impacts these bottom lines as well going forward. But Jenny Horn, always a pleasure. And thanks for stopping by. As we say goodbye to Jenny, I want to welcome in Megan Brantley, the VP of research at likefolio.com. Let's see how much people are talking about taking Lyft uh, in terms of consumer purchase intent mentions because, you know, Megan, this is one of those things where they've certainly expanded uh, substantially over the past few years here uh, in the U.S. and other e English-speaking countries. But, you know, basically the worst-case scenario of what could happen uh, took place over the last year for these companies. Yeah, so whenever we look at Lyft, I know last quarter it benefited from this reopening mindset. And so this quarter we really wanted to look and say, okay, is it truly benefiting? Are more people traveling? Are more people, you know, going to these bars and restaurants? Are more people traveling to work? And and so far in our data, at least um, in the last month especially, we're seeing a lot of this return. We're seeing a lot of short-term strength. We're seeing whenever you look at rideshare for entertainment, so taking an Uber or Lyft to a bar or restaurant, that's up 15% quarter over quarter. Ride sharing for travel, so to or from a hotel is up about 30% quarter over quarter. Even ride sharing to work is up about 10% quarter over quarter, while this work from home mentions falls about the same rate in the same time frame. So I think that these signs, this is what's kind of lifting this green um, demand line that you're looking at now for Lyft. So these are mentions of people who are downloading or using Lyft. And if you look up there at the top of that 30 day change, that quarter over quarter up about 49% and year over year up about 28%. So I think that this is I guess on the bright side, you could say that yes, demand is is certainly returning and people are starting to turn to these rideshare services like Lyft and like Uber um, to st as, as they start to do fun things away from their house or as they start traveling for work again. But I think on the flip side, whenever we look at sentiment, that's actually fallen about seven points year over year. And a lot of this has to do with what Jenny mentioned, these mentions uh, or these mentions of driver shortages, maybe people can't get a lift and also these price increases a lot of mentions talked about how lifts now are more expensive than they were in the past. And so I think that it's one of those things where demand is certainly there. It's now the question of is the lift able to actually, you know, capitalize on this demand? Megan, 
You know, we've been talking a lot over the last 12 to 13 months about stickiness, right? Yeah. Demand getting better in some of these companies and the stickiness of that demand. Is there a reverse stickiness going on here? Because <laughs> this demand dropped and some of that negative, that less demand, is has a chance to be sticky as people say you know i used to take uber i used to take lyft i don't anymore i find a different way maybe i bought a car maybe i moved to the suburbs maybe i don't go into the office anymore is there you know so many times we've had a discussion about stickiness in terms of a positive reaction is there a chance that there's negative stickiness here you know, that's really interesting, uh, kind of like the inverse play, if you will, of this, you know, what, yeah. what behaviors are taking hold for consumers. I think, you know, this this big, this big reshuffling, if you will, of consumers who are moving to the more suburban areas, that's definitely an interesting theory to, um, to pursue. But I think one thing that you mentioned before is really significant that a lot of Lyft's revenue, a lot of Uber's revenue comes from these big cities. And so I don't necessarily think that there's I mean, that there's this big shift in how big people in these larger cities are operating. We're definitely seeing some stickiness in terms of working from home, but I'm not certain what portion of people who are taking Uber or Lyft for work is the big share of their revenue. I think these entertainment features, this traveling, you know, taking Lyft and Uber for entertainment venues, this is, there's a lot of pent up demand there. And there's a lot of people who are wanting to get out and do these things. You know, I know that I've been in Ubers and Lyfts way more recently than I was in the past few months. I know that people are starting to travel for work again. For example, Andy and Landon are traveling for work right now. And I'm sure that they're taking Ubers and Lyfts. And so I think this is one of those things where, I don't know, can you guys imagine a world where there's not an Uber and Lyft? But um, we're certainly not to where we were pre-pandemic, but we are showing signs of recover, at least in consumer demand, if Lyft can be there to meet those needs. Kevin, I'll throw you a bone, uh, and I, you know, I'll admit it, I took a taxi cab <laughs> home from the airport there because it I didn't is. want to wait for Uber or Lyft, and I'm sure it was more expensive, but it was already there, and I just got in it, and it was easy, uh, and so I'll, I'll throw you the bone there. I think that there's probably a little bit of that going on. People are impatient, but uh, Megan, the question that I have because, you know, markets tend to normalize as prices go up, more drivers will come on, more uh, more consumers will find alternatives, things will normalize again, we'll kind of eventually maybe get back to where we were uh, with some maybe price inflation there. But the question I have is regarding the pace at which things are coming back, is it enough to justify the move that we've seen off of the lows of, let's say, last fall, where you saw Lyft trading down at $21 in November, now trading $54 uh, but of course, this is about $14 off of where it was just trading. So you kind of have a, a huge bounce, but also we've sold off substantially from the highs uh, of, of recent as well. So from like Folio standpoint, is the data strong enough yet? Or is this one where you're still waiting to see uh, more growth and more rapid adoption of, of a reopening before you're jumping in? This is one that whenever you look at our earnings signal, it's sitting at about a negative 12. So this is real. This is neutral. I would say it's leaning a little bit bearish, um, but definitely safely in the neutral segment whenever it comes to this earnings event specifically. Um, on the bright side, I really think it depends on what investors latch on to. You know, are, are we focused more on these signs of recovery if Lyft makes um, comments that, you know, they are starting to return to these pre-pandemic um, areas and that may be taken very positively. However, if they, you know, make comments about some of these headwinds, maybe, you know, driver shortages or even this, you know, this gig worker benefit potential regulation that's looming, I think that could be perceived negatively. A lot of this depends on on guidance and, and how optimistic the company is moving forward. I'm not sure that it'll be enough. And I think that that's why we're, we're sitting more in the neutral category. I know on our, you know, this earnings document that we put out, I know Andy and Landon are both sidelined for this earnings event. Well, we're looking forward to it nonetheless after the close today. We'll see what investors latch on to. So I think that's a, yeah. a really interesting point, which is, you know, there's going to be some good and there's going to be some bad. We'll see what takes hold in the aftermarket today. Megan Brantley, always a pleasure. Thanks for stopping by. I look forward to talking to you again soon. All right, Kevin. So this is where things get interesting for the individual investor and trader as well, which is, as Megan laid out, as you've laid out,